So welcome everybody. We have Nathan with us this morning, Nathan Jishin Michon. Um, Nathan is a postdoctoral JSPS research fellow at the Ryokoku University in Kyoto in Japan, focused on Buddhist chaplaincy. They especially focus on the development of Buddhist chaplaincy training programs around Japan. Jishin previously worked in hospice and disaster care. They previously trained in Zen and Thai forest tradition for a number of years, and then ordained both as a Shingon Buddhist priest and as an interfaith minister. Jishin is the editor of works such as Refuge in the Storm, Buddhist Voices in Crisis Care. That's this book that I'm holding here. This just came out very recently, um, I think at the end of last year, and it's a, it's a compilation um, of different essays around uh, the subject of um, crisis care and Buddhist chaplaincy in crisis care. So this is, if you know, for anybody who is interested in this subject, I, I, I believe that this is quite a unique publication. Um, and then also another book, A Thousand Hands, a guidebook to caring for your Buddhist community. And um, Jishin is also the co-author and the Oxford Research Encyc of the Oxford Research Encyclopedia's entry on Buddhist chaplaincy, among other works. Okay, so wonderful. So thank you so much for joining us, thank Jishin. You for me. <laughs> I will I will pass it over to you. All right. And also, I apologize for my mix up last time and forgetting that the US has the time changes. <laughs> so, um, aware of it now and here with you, which is my 1 a.m. Japan time. Um, so, I do want to mention that I, I might have a little brain freeze pause on occasion at this hour so we'll see um but please forgive me if that happens as i'm waking up and starting the systems again here <laughs> um but anyways it is wonderful to be with you all today and yeah i I am here in Japan. I've spent a good portion, at least, of the past decade here. And uh, one of the things I was doing, um, just start a little bit talking about uh, some of these activities up in northern Japan, Sendai. Uh, and that's, of course, where they had the, a huge tsunami and earthquake that most people know of uh, just over 10 years ago. Uh, I, th I think in the US, for example, most people have heard of Fukushima, um, but Fukushima prefecture was actually the prefecture just south of where the epicenter was. Um, and the epicenter hit just off the coast of Miyagi, prefecture um, where Sendai is and the surrounding villages. And as far as the tsunami was concerned and the real epicenter of the earthquake, that's where the huge damage was, and especially along the coast. Um, a literally over a hundred foot tsunami at its height. Um, crashing into the coast. So if you can imagine what a wave that big um, would be like, it caused incredible damage there. Uh, and of course, vast devastation, but um, also be in the wake of that, um, it also really an incredible outpouring of volunteerism and support uh, and the Buddhist community included. And one of those movements and um, kind of 
events <laughs> at first that were begun was by a Zen monk uh, named Kanata Taisho. And he started a, a little thing called Cafe de Monk. <laughs> and this was a little play on words because monk in English, of course, means monk. But in Japanese, the word monku means to complain. And so this was a place where people just kind of surviving and getting their bearings still could come to these sort of pop-up cafes and complain about <laughs> what was happening in their lives to the monks. Um, so in a sense, it was a, they were little volunteer um, chaplaincy cafes, listening cafes, um, where people could come and attend. And at first, um, the intention was to really be with people and listen to their stories. But uh, as Kanata Tayo, the founder, came to find, find out, at first, nobody really wanted to share <laughs> their stories. Um, Partly, this is due to the fact that um, basic disaster care, crisis care thing that he was finding out as he went along. Um, a lot of people just after the fact don't necessarily want to share their stories right away and don't even necessarily have their bearings at that point either. Um, so trying to force that out or um, welcome that doesn't necessarily come with a, a great response at first. And so in his case, he was finding it out a little more trial by error, just trying to start some movements. But um, the, the cafe sort of began to take on patterns that it would show throughout the subsequent years, where at first they would simply offer and set out at group tables uh, the tea, the coffee, free snacks, and things like that. And people could simply be with others um, in these new communities. And um, the the ability to simply have some light chit chat and talk with others lightly without really having to think about other things at first started to open people up and so at these events as they came to form through the years afterwards that's typically how they start. Um, people come in, sit around group tables, have a chance to be with others. Uh, they're often in these temporary housing communities uh, that were set up. So it's kind of new communities who are formed from survivors of the disaster. And it, after having this chance to warm up and talk, then sometimes the stories would start to emerge. And so it would be a little bit more of an organic process. And in each of these tables, there would be maybe a few to several um, people from the community along with one or two volunteers uh, sitting at each table. And so there was the chance both to uh, talk about things in a group if people wanted to, or uh, if somebody was struggling with a story and seemed like maybe they want to say start saying something, but a little hesitant, then one of the volunteers can say, oh, would you like to talk about that? Um, a little more in private off to the side. And so then we could just 
um, invite somebody to some chairs more to the side of the room uh, and talk more privately if they preferred that as well. Um, so it was a much more organic process in that way compared to um, what he started with originally. And I, it ended up also incorporating a lot more community building I, alongside it as well. And so he would sometimes have karaoke in there as well, uh, incorporating local songs and local traditional dance into the, the cafe experiences. So uh, it, would, it would kind of have a, a pattern of a little bit more joyful come together activities and chatting and then if people want to dive a little deep down um, in these conversations there the middle portion had more of these conversation times before the the final portion of the cafe events was more about coming together again and having this song and dance and community activity um, for people to really come together in these newfound communities and build some connections and joyful memories with that as well. Um, and that was also a really important part of it. Uh, and so I have just to try to share a screen here. Um, a few little pictures and video clips of one of those events. Um, this was actually the final Cafe de Monk event at one of the temporary housing units that um, lasted a fair amount of time. I think this was the eighth year after the disaster. Um, and the temporary housing units were just getting ready to close. So there was at this by this point, many of the people were really familiar with um, the Cafe de Monk event and familiar with many of the volunteers as well. Um, but there was a kind of sense of closure to one chapter and transition occurring at it as well by this point. Um, so it was, it, it had a lot of this mix of feelings um, from everything that had gone on the past eight years within this event. There are also some local high school volunteers who came to sing. And <laughs> uh, this is the, the founder, Monk, actually plays guitar as well and led some songs on guitar play around the end of the event time. So people were coming together, clapping together. You can see. Here's one of these, the traditional local uh, dance of the area that gradually more and more people came and joined the circle with. Um, even gave away some little pieces of art with, through a giant, giant game of um, John Kimpong, what is that in English? <laughs> rock, scissors, paper. <laughs> um, and so they had a sort of rock, scissors, paper tournament to give away this local art. Karaoke. Um, and then this is just a picture of the volunteers who were there during that particular time. Um, at this point, uh, it, many of the volunteers at first came from all over Japan. Uh, then it gradually became mostly people of the region, but 
for the final session or two, uh, again, there were many people coming from all over Japan. Uh, so there, there was also a, a bit of a reunion sense of sorts uh, as people recognized all these volunteers of the past who had come to be with them as well. And so, um, again, it, it's a place of very, uh, as you could probably imagine, very mixed emotions and feelings and things going on. But um, I, along with the, the troubles and the sadness and the heavy difficulty, um, also these aspects of joy and coming together too. And that in these kind of situations, um, I think is incredibly important as well. Um, because although it is important to touch into these difficulties that people went through, and they were um, very extreme in many cases, uh, just as an example, along the coastline with some of the small villages, one of the people I I listened to, a, a couple of the people coming from the smaller villages right at the coast, um, nearly half of the people living in such villages were lost during the disaster. So um, you could imagine there's a lot of trauma <laughs> and the experiences there. Um, but to also come together at those times and form these new bonds and community and sort of get people out of their own rooms and spaces and into um, space together where they can form some new joyful memories um, is also incredibly important during those times. Uh, I also just want to, uh, talking about these stories and this sort of example for the first half, um, I want to just read one page from this book, if you don't mind, um, where I translated a number of long quotes from this founder. And so just give him a little voice into um, some of the things he was talking about. And if I think a lot of you are familiar with chaplaincy. Some aspects of this are probably um, rather familiar to you, but I think he also in this selection brings out a number of points um, particular to Japanese culture and language as well, which might be interesting. Um, so this is a quote from Kanata. Quote, even when a person says pain, 10 different people probably use that word with 10 different meanings. There's a story behind each of those words. To help truly understand what they are saying and to show them we are present, we have to listen not only with our ears, but with our entire bodies." End quote. He points out that Japanese has two different characters to write listen, even though they are pronounced the same way, kiku. The first character simply refers to the common idea of listening through the ears. But the second, begin quote, it means listening with all your heart and mind throughout the body. The sound that enters our ears carries not only information, but emotion, the way of speaking, the intonation, the subtle senses that surround it all. We have to observe those clues carefully to truly listen. It involves listening with all our senses and our entire bodies. Without this, we can't get to the heart of what they are truly trying to say. End quote. I, Café de Monk, however, is not always a somber place. Quite to the contrary, as you saw in a couple of those clips, uh, it is peppered uh, with, with humor. Kanata believes that humor is important in times of sadness and suffering. 
uh, the play on words of in the very name of the cafe tried to lighten the mood from the get-go. One more quote from him. I like to play with words. One of the ways to refer to Buddhist priests in Japan, bozu, has the same pronunciation in Japanese as the popular music speaker company, Bose. Uh, making little jokes while playing with words uh, in the conversations helped to lighten the mood and loosen people's tension. Of course, you also have to be very careful with humor. If you are perceived as making light of another's suffering, you can make their wounds cut even deeper than they already are. We have to also be careful not to assume that a joke that works in one situation will work equally well in another. But by reading the room and the atmosphere, it can be a great tool to loosen the tension in the air. Viktor Frankl once said, humor is another, is another of the soul's weapons in the fight for self-preservation. A good joke can actually connect to and sympathize with another's pain. I think that humor done with deep listening is born in and for the present moment as an art of improvised love." End quote. So I, I think that touches on the kind of dual um, set of how he balances uh, a lot of his character in engaging with uh, these post-disaster communities. Um, just to point out uh, also a couple tidbits of point post-disaster care in chaplaincy and spiritual care. Um, one thing also to keep in mind in really these disaster situations and a lot of heavy crisis situations is also, also along these lines of people not necessarily being ready to tell their story right away. Um, one of the things we have to keep in mind is to first just check in on basic needs. <laughs> um, when people are especially just coming out of disaster or crisis, uh, severe crisis situation, they're not really necessarily thinking straight at this point. Um, I like to think of it along the lines of being out at a deck near sea if somebody is in danger of drowning and just sending out that life preserver to start. Um, just pe giving people first a basis to start being able to comfortably float in that sea still. Um, so people might not even be ready to or in a state where they can solidly stand with two feet on the land, but just to have that thing that helps uh, give them something to grab onto, to float. And one thing we can do is just through our own calming presence. So making sure, of course, that we are first um, coming to them with at least some baseline sense of calm presence to be with them um, that can often give people something to hang on to in those moments um, but also again to check in on basic needs first uh, many people coming out of especially a crisis or disaster they might not even be really thinking about their food or their, how much the water they've had recently and just taking a moment with them and asking, do you need anything to drink? Do you need anything to eat? It might suddenly bring awareness to some of these physical needs and like, oh, wow. Yeah, I think I really am incredibly thirsty right now. Um, some people in that situation, just again, they might not really be aware of the basic needs like that, but also checking in with things like um, medicine. If people, for example, in a, a severe disaster 
um, situation. Um, they might be leaving the house really, really quickly. Um, maybe not taking it um, really important medications with them uh, that might be really necessary that day or in the coming days. And so checking in on these kind of things as well can be really important. People say, oh, yes, I actually totally forgot, but um, I lift these medications at, at home. Do you think there's any available? So um, it, at a um, maybe a Red Cross station or something like that, then you could go and connect them to uh, the medical personnel that they might need in those cases. Um, and so one of these initial things is also just being a connection point. Um, checking in with people, what are their needs, and connecting them to um, after this kind of first initial uh, check-in analysis, who might they need to be in contact with. Um, and again, people might not be ready to to share their stories at first um, and don't feel like you need to um, force that in any way. But if they are, and if they do start to um, seem to want to share their stories, then we can help them to slowly piece together what has just happened and um, engage in our deep listening in that way. Um, so I'll stop this share and transition a little bit more into um, this aspect of compassion and um, trying to hold the right types of compassion in these situations as well. Um, because one thing to keep in mind is also that compassion is not simply one box of an attitude or the um, state of mind to have. There can be many, many different types of compassion. And so some of these compa types of compassion in different scenarios especially can be more healthy than other types as well. And if you pause to think about it, some types of compassion, we, we think of compassion usually as a good thing, but some types of compassion might not be fully healthy for us. Uh, taking a moment, can you think of some examples of that maybe? Um, for example, and some things might, for example, lead to um, ultimately post um, PTSD uh, and compassion fatigue. Um, we have these words like secondary stress um, so or secondary stress syndromes. And so uh, these refer to uh, secondary stress or secondary traumatic stress uh, can re refer to these states where we end up taking on um, a lot of the feelings of the people who we are with in ways that it also causes us trauma. <laughs> and so we have to be very careful of that. Uh, compassion fatigue, if we are um, in such a state for too long over a sustained period of time, or for example, um, chaplains working in trauma wards, nurses working in trauma wards, day in, day out, um, compassion towards the other and hearing these difficult stories time and time again uh, can lead to these situations where we also um, just feel burned out by that compassion. And so we have to be a little careful of uh, these types of states. 
So just get some tea in me. And so then that brings up a little bit of a question. Um, and this question can come up with a lot of doctors, nurses, cri crisis workers, and of course, chaplains um, in trauma wards, post-disaster care in situations like this. Oh, what ultimately do we do with our hearts? Do we close them up and protect ourselves? Um, kind of make a little bit of a wall? Or do we open ourselves up and then potentially also not just open our hearts up, but also open us up to um, potential pain and difficulties in ourselves as well. Uh, however, I think in working through this question, again, keeping in mind there's different types of compassion and different approaches to compassion, um, I think it's useful to take one step back uh, and think about the word compassion as well uh, from a couple perspectives. I, this English word compassion ultimately comes from the Latin root compati. Um, and that, as was pointed out to me in many uh, chaplaincy trainings and um, experiences and uh, even chaplaincy courses, this Latin root means to suffer together. And it, in some ways, I, I think that's that can be heartwarming and nice, but also I remember as a Buddhist in my MDiv courses, uh, MDiv chaplaincy courses, ultimately thinking and writing in a number of my reflection papers, uh, well, as a Buddhist, my goal that I'm often thinking about is overcoming suffering. <laughs> and so how do I balance this with this uh, other idea of suffering together? Um, and, isn't this something I'm supposed to be getting past, getting over, getting through? Um, and I, I think actually this idea of karuna um, in, Buddha, in Buddhism is actually very telling. And um, as Bhikkhu Analayo points out, uh, compassion is in this Buddhist sense uh, of the word karuna, more the concern for others. And so he emphasizes that rather than um, compassion being a focus on suffering, which would be a, a, an actual different kind of meditation, a different kind, kind of state of mind, that um, karuna is the focus on this concern for others' well-being and the hope that they will be better and be released from suffering. So uh, the focus is more on this um, concern and hope um, for release of suffering rather than the suffering itself. And I think that's an interesting and important a way to also be thinking about compassion um, during these times of care. Uh, interesting enough, uh, some recent psychologists and psychologic, those doing psychological studies on compassion uh, have <laughs> had a lot of influence from um, Buddhist traditions in recent years and also just from the way they are studying uh, compassion themselves, have come to a rather similar conclusion. Um, one of the ways that uh, some of these psychologists define compassion is a state of concern for the suffering or unmet needs of another, coupled with a desire to alleviate that suffering. 
Uh, and so that um, that definition in many ways is really, really similar to this definition of karuna and how Bhikkhu Analayo uh, defines it as well. Uh, again, emphasizing this concern and the hope or desire that suffering will disappear. Um, just to say though briefly, compassion, as far as defining compassion, um, it can come, we can speak of compassion in a lot of different ways in English and in some of these psychological studies in improving compassion and the capacity for compassion. Uh, so just several of the ways that um, psychologists point out that it's described, it can be a discrete emotion or specific aspects of an emotion. Um, we can also talk about compassion as a type of motivation uh, towards helping others or a disposition or a personality trait. Um, and in this way, it can be measured in how it occurs over time or in uh, how it changes within us from different contexts. Um, of course, speaking of modern psychologists, I, it can also be defined through different biological antecedents, different um, things within our neurochemistry as well. Um, and it can be overlapping with some other words like empathy and altruism. Uh, so there are a number of different ways that um, we can talk about compassion, but one, one study I, I just want to highlight briefly I, is uh, pointed out by um, those, a, a couple people pretty close to uh, where the study center is actually um, based at Stanford University. Uh, so one of those being Jamil Zaki, a professor there who does some really important work with compassion. And he helped in a large study of nurses um, looking into the different types of compassion that they described feeling. And he ultimately uh, categorized three types of um, main forms of compassion that people were describing. And so one of those is called, he calls sharing. And so this type of compassion is the, in some ways, the most base level um, that's really natural to us as humans, um, where we just reflect in many ways what is happening in the person in front of us, before us. And I, I say one of the most base um, types of human compassion in some ways, because even babies um, show this a lot from, from birth. If you think of young babies and young little children, um, if we're by them and upset or crying. What What is a baby likely to do? The baby is probably going to be upset and crying, right? Um, but if we are laughing and giggling, uh, the baby in front of us might also reflect that laugh and giggle as well, right? Um, so this, this is very, very natural um, that we reflect the emotions and states from the people in front of us. Um, but this is one way that we can talk about and describe compassion. I, a second way is what he calls thinking about or a, a cognitive form of compassion, uh, where we imagine um, what is this state of um, emotional level and what is going on 
uh, in the people in front of us and think about it in a more um, kind of co this cognitive type of way where we understand what is going on in another, but maybe um, not so much the emotions going on with it. I, a third way, a third category uh, is this caring about. Um, so another name for this is empathic concern. Um, so this is the actual concern and hope that another person's suffering will diminish. Um, so again, just to recap, that's the sharing, um, the, the cognitive aspect, thinking about, and then the caring about. And so at different points in time, we might go through, as we're sitting in front of another, we might go through all three of these um, from moment to moment, and we might uh, have two or three of these different types all at once, or maybe we just have um, one of those more so, one of those types of compassion um, that are more dominant within us. And so from moment to moment, it can change in these three modes. Um, might One might be there, two or three, or it might go back to just one of them. Um, we're, we're humans, we change from time to time in those interactions. But one of the really interesting points from these studies uh, was that for the most part, those who were much more focused, those nurses who were much more focused on the aspect of sharing, uh, reflecting emotions of those in front of them, were far more likely to experience uh, secondary stress and compassion fatigue. Where those who were much more focused on the aspect of empathic concern, of caring about this hope that others' um, suffering will diminish, they were far less likely to experience um, secondary stress and compassion fatigue. Uh, and so I, in starting to wrap up here, I, I'll share at least this one longer quote from Eve Ickman, who is also involved in those studies. So she summarizes saying, Empathic distress and empathic concern are only weakly related. Someone who experiences deep distress does not necessarily feel deep concern and vice versa. In caring professions, knowing the difference between these states is vital. Distress motivates people to escape others suffering. But caregivers can't do that without abandoning their post. This leaves them with a punishing psychological burden. In fact, of the different kinds of empathy, only distress tracks burnout among doctors, nurses, and social workers. I imagine chaplains as well. Um, concern, on the other hand, it gives them a way to emotionally connect with patients without taking on their pain. And caregivers who tend towards concern rather than distress are less likely to suffer from empathic injuries. In other words, empathy and compassion, it doesn't have to produce burnout at all. And experiencing the right kind might actually prevent it. So 
Um, one of these important aspects then uh, is, of course, from moment to moment, being aware of what are we feeling? What type of compassion or empathy are we feeling uh, when we're in front of the others? And um, then with that awareness, we can slowly direct these forms of compassion that we feel towards others to um, more healthy states and more sustainable states of compassion um, when engaging with the suffering of others in front of us. Um, and as one final note on that, those lines, um, one of my areas of research besides um, looking into these different types of compassion as well um, is also the Buddhist applications of that. And um, there are, in Buddhist traditions, of course, so, so many forms of compassion practices. And um, many ways of developing compassion and a very clear acknowledgement of the existence of different forms of compassion. Um, and so I'm also looking at what, what do these, what might these different ideas of compassion from Buddhist traditions uh, mean for cultivating ourselves in ways similar to, to this? Um, and how can we maybe take from Buddhist traditions and um, through coming years and decades, maybe also contribute to um, the caring fields as a whole um, with these insights from these centuries of Buddhist practices and ways that we can cultivate and contribute to compassionate development uh, to better care for uh, people as well. And so thank you again um, for yeah, um, for your presence with me here. And if there's any questions during these, I believe it's around 10 minutes, um, feel free or comments as well. Share your own wisdom as well. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for this. Um, I'm gonna say, you know, uh, I actually find it useful to completely use those words differently, empathy and compassion. Mm -hmm. It just seems to make more sense to me. And I think, um, you know, empathy is certainly a primer for compassion. I'm kind of, you know, <laughs> I'm giving off uh, trainings that I've had from other people without giving sure. them credit, <laughs> let's say. But yeah, and um, so, and what they would say um, is that there is no such thing actually as compassion fatigue. There's only empathy fatigue. Mm -hmm. I just find it a useful way of framing. And then, you know, what I see with people who are overly empathic or actually, you know, identify themselves <laughs> that way as an empath is they get so over, they, you know, in some cases get so overwhelmed, they're actually not effective anymore because they become the person who's needy I think the other thing I see is that they often because they're so identified um, with being empathic they're actually projecting something onto that person they're with instead of actually seeing what is there and I guess you know I, I love neuroscience I'm sorry I, I think that Buddha would have been a neuroscientist. <laughs> no, <laughs> no apologies necessary. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, I think what, what we know now from neuroscience is that compassion actually lights up the reward centers of the brain. And it's exactly that um, desire to alleviate suffering. Isn't that such a feel good state when you actually focus on that, the desire to alleviate suffering? Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I was just thinking too, you know, compassion. We often think of the um, the near enemy as pity, but I actually think maybe another near en enemy could also be 
empathic distress or empathic fatigue. Okay, thank you. I just, you know, I'd like to hear what you have to say about that. Oh, I, really important and great comments. Thank you. Um, and I, <laughs> I did originally mean, mean to uh, at least note about compassion and empathy. Um, so thank you for pointing that out. Um, both of these words, depending on the field and even within fields, the definitions are not fully consistent yet. So I, I use them today as synonyms, but as you point out, they aren't always synonyms. Um, and sometimes they, um, like in the case you point out, I, compassion used more in this way we were talking about with um, empathic concern, um, whereas empathy, um, is in this way used more as this variance of different states. Um, but there's still a lot of simply inconsistency in the way compassion is used and referred to. Um, so that's English, that's humanity, human nature. <laughs> um, we, we use words and words word usage and develop um, develops and changes over time and um, is used in different ways in different fields and areas as well. So compassion is in some ways just still a very inconsistent uh, word when we really break it down. Um, so in some of these big psychological wor uh, works as well that they're talking about compassion, they often acknowledge this. They're like, well, there's all these different ways we're using compassion. I, I pointed some of those out a little earlier, but then they usually establish, this is what we're using for this case and right, right here, right now. Um, so again, thank you for <laughs> doing that clarity. Um, Sometimes uh, in, deeper into these fields, um, people are now, I, I do think it is increasing more and more where compassion refers more to this empathic concern state as something similar to Karuna. Um, but it also isn't always the case because the word just has all these different uses as well. Um, but either way, Again, I think the Buddhist insight of the importance of that um, really shows up in uh, the, this empathic concern style of compassion really shows up in these studies, um, whether neuroscience wise or more um, through these interviews and other forms of studies. Um, and another point I, th I think related to, um, you, you brought up near enemies, but also just, I think, from these Buddhist insights of compassion is the, like, the balance as well that is so important. Um, compassion doesn't come by itself, it comes in a set uh, all the time, and so doing it with equanimity and these other states is also so important as well. <laughs> um, that's a whole subject in itself, but I want to give other people time. Uh, Jim raised his hand. Yeah. Hi, Jishin. Thank you. Um, yeah, I liked what you're saying about the difference between empathic concern and empathic distress. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking for me, um, and offering spiritual care, especially in the, uh, an emergency department or the ICU, yeah. how some cases just you know stick with me and, and do cause distress, mm -hmm. and then some don't seem to, you know. And that so it seems like I, I'll experience both of those things, but it seems that the things that I'm still afraid of are the things that will cause me distress. So when I encounter something maybe 
a life situation that reminds me of my own or, or some particular disease or trauma I fear, then that's typically when I, I respond more with the distress and, and less of the concern. So I was just curious for you, having done kind of long-term spiritual care in, in crisis, how you've dealt with that dynamic of, of distress and concern and how you've kind of navigated that and, and taken care of yourself along the way. Yeah, thanks. Great question. And I, I think for me that my Buddhist influence also really comes out in this, but um, taking sort of moment to moment the the Four Noble Truths, um, not just as a philosophy, but as a moment to moment practice in those kind of times, I also find really useful. So that um, empathic distress essentially being the moment of that first noble truth. And that's the stress and suffering. And each of these has a, a task or a, a mental um, exercise to it. So the first um, noble truth, the exercise with that is uh, deep exploration and understanding. Um, so what is this <laughs> empathic distress? What is this aspect of suffering? As we understand it more, that leads to the second one, uh, the origin of suffering and stress. And so, aha, <laughs> okay, this is something of where that's coming from. Uh, the, the task of that, that one to let go in whatever way we can um, of that origin. And that leads to the third one, the cessation. Um, so in, in that way, we, in a sense, transition to, um, to the empathic concern and then um, moving into the practice again, the, the Eightfold Path where we uh, revitalize and can more thoroughly do um, our right speech, right listening, um, right action, being with the people in front of the, uh, in front of us through those principles of the Eightfold Path, um, it creates a kind of positive feedback loop in the practice, I think, um, going through that. I, of course, it is a practice, <laughs> um, not necessarily easy to do in all times, but um, the more focused on that, I feel it, it can be this sort of positive feedback loop from moment to moment of, oh, here's, now I'm aware of something going on. What's causing this? How can I let that go in the best, at, at least as best as possible in this moment to get my focus back? And okay, now I'm back. How do I get deeper into it? Um, and then getting deeper into it, you might find a more subtle form of something going on. <laughs> and then again, this positive feedback loop, hopefully going deeper and deeper, or at least building good patterns of mind, we can um strengthen our hearts in that way <laughs> over time um and build see deeper into our patterns of what's going on and how we work with and get through those times as well so, at least thank you briefly that's just one of my personal practices in those times Jishin, do, you, do you have an example of how that supported you in your own spiritual care provision um, I mean, I, just this example of, um, empathic distress, um, for example, like, actually, one thing I even came I think I wrote about it early on in this book. There was this a time where this 
I wasn't really ready um, for this individual who was in front of me. And I, I was new to Cafe de Monk at the time, and I wasn't sure exactly what was going on. And I suddenly was listening to this person who I thought was another volunteer. And then they they heard that I was a chaplain and a Buddhist priest and suddenly launched into this story of deep distress that they were. <laughs> um, it, it was almost like bubble bursting and ready to come out. And I, I was a little caught off guard at first. Um, and so it, it kind of froze me physically a little bit for some moments even. And it, I saw my internal gears turning like, whoa, 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 whoa. This is, <laughs> this is not simply getting my orientation into being here this time. This is like, I have to jump into chaplain mode and um, sort of working with all the internal dynamics then. Um, I definitely had a lot of empathic distress working in me at that time, but um, seeing some of the origins, I, oh, my lack of mental preparation for being in this moment at this time, um, and I, so just in that case, it was just like, I need to reorient myself right now and recenter and be put my attention in the right place. And that at least allowed for the beginning of this more transition into really being with the individual in front of me at that time and um, trying to let go also, again, kind of a, a number of things going on. It allowed me to see then some of the tension inside me. Um, okay, lots of tension inside me. How do I just let go of that? Okay, maybe I'll breathe with that a little more and let some of those physical tensions ease. Okay, now I'm getting more deeper with this person. Um, again, the kind of a, a small summary of some complex things going on um, at that time, but in that way, it's kind of just, in a sense, going through these steps from moment to moment um, as best as I possibly can without taking too much focus away from the person in front of me. But um, I think in those moments when I, I see that distraction going on, something that's significantly distracting or putting me in um, a, a more unhealthy state of mind, which also is not contributing to good presence with the other, um, just to take a little moment to be embodied and deal with that um, helps free the attention up to really better be with the person in front of me as well. <laughs> I, did was that a, an example like you were looking for or yeah that was, that was brilliant brilliant thanks so much really appreciate it thank you and thank you nathan i see what we're i wouldn't say we're at time and we're a little bit past time yeah <laughs> so we'll need to wrap up now but thank you everybody for joining us this morning thank you nathan for joining us this morning and i guess this evening for you yeah, whatever this time is called. <laughs> Middle of the night. Global time. Um, so I will ask the, the current Sati Center chaplaincy students to hang back. 
Um, and then I will say goodbye to everybody else. I'm just posting in the chat real quick the donations link. Thank you so much to everybody who offers Dana for this program. It's very, very, very helpful. So the link is there in the chat if you would like to donate this, this month. And wonderful to see you all. And we'll see you next month. Um, on the 20th of April, we have uh, Grace Shearson will be joining us um, to talk about Buddhist chaplaincy and her experiences. And another reminder that on the 13th of April, for the whole morning, we'll have an event introducing the Sati Center's Buddhist chaplaincy training, both of the programs, the online program, which is the remote program and the in-person training. So if anybody is interested, we'll be very happy to see you there. And it all takes place at the same Zoom link. Okay, thank you, everybody. And, and students, hang back.